Uh, again, Dr. David Jefferson is up next, verified voting, one of my go-to sites whenever I have to have real facts. And he'll be talking on the internet and elections in 2017. And uh, I've seen some of his presentations before. Always, always impressive. Uh, and we'll be taking a brief break after this. And uh, again, go to nvrtf.org. If you like what you're seeing, write a check. You'll like it a lot more after this presentation. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So this is, uh, I'm going to be talking about internet voting and the internet in general and the Russians and blockchains and uh, whatever we have time for. Okay, so this is the image that is projected to the public by people who are advocates of online voting. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to vote privately from, from your own home or your hotel room or your car or wherever you are online uh, and without having to wait until election day, without having to go to the polls, uh, through the same medium in which you are studying the issues and the candidates and so on. And it, it makes a lot of sense. It's a nice vision. Um, but we have to remember that Election security is an aspect of U.S. national security, and it has to be taken that seriously. And unfortunately, the computer and, next slide, <laughs> and the next one. Uh, unfortunately, the computer and the election uh, security community is virtually unanimous. It is not possible with any current or foreseeable technology to adequately secure an online election from cyber attacks. That's any foreseeable technology, including those that people are talking about all the time. Um, the people around, uh, the photographs around this are people, uh, um, election experts and security experts from around the United States who have been in all working in uh, voting related technology and security issues for a long time. So I want to talk first about email voting. The email voting is legal in about 30 some states. Oh, sorry, next slide. I keep, keep forgetting to tell you to move to the next slide. And the next slide. Um, and people have the impression, or even election officials sometimes have the impression, that email voting is equivalent to uh, um, paper vote by mail. From a security point of view, it's not remotely equivalent. Because email voting is subject to automated, remote, programmed attacks from anywhere in the world, by anyone, from a disaffected teenager to a domestic political partisan to a foreign nation state. Here are the flags of, the, of a few nation states that might be interested in screwing with our email voting. Um, email voting, as I said, is, is allowed in 30-some states in the United States, but we do not know how many votes are cast that way. Rumbling? Uh, most people don't. Um, sad to say. In most cases, this, it's only uh, uh, permitted for UOCAVA voters, that is to say, uh, military and overseas voters and overseas citizens living overseas. Um, but in some states, I just learned that Washington is one of them, all voters can vote by email. Okay, um, now here are the vulnerabilities in email voting and, wh and wh why it's such a terrible idea. So email and its attachments, the ballot and the attestation and so on that you uh, send with the ballot, are not end-to-end -end encrypted. They are, uh, they're sent in clear text. The headers of email are, are totally forgeable and are never encrypted. So that means that as the email is forwarded from computer to computer and router to router along the way, um, the email can be copied, it can be dropped, it can be delayed arbitrarily, or it can be modified in transit by anyone who controls one of those relaying computers. Um, 
this was demonstrated by Galois in 2014, where the router in question that modified the ballot on the fly was your home router, uh, just outside, just you know, in your garage. Um, and of course, the voter's name travels with the ballot, and all privacy is lost because the, the voter's name travels with the ballot. If anybody is actually looking at those unencrypted ballots in transit, uh, email attacks are are generally undetectable, and if detected are uncorrectable. Uh, fake ballots that contain malware can be submitted along with real ballots and those and the malware then can infect the uh, the computers that receive those ballots in the email. Um, email is a basically a security disaster and uh, I liken attaching an email attaching a ballot to an email to attaching a hundred dollar bill to a postcard and expecting it to be delivered unmolested to the destination. Uh, it's my opinion that email is by far the most dangerous form of voting ever invented as far as its vulnerability to remote and undetectable uh, mischief. All right, but I want to dismiss email voting now um, because when people think about online voting, they usually think of web-based voting, not email, even though uh, right now web-based voting is only used in a very few states by a, by a few overseas voters. Um, Alaska recently had uh, web-based voting for all of its voters, but we understand that it is eliminating it uh, for the next elections. Um, there are various kinds of a cyber attack that occur that are, that are possible. Uh, thank you, you're following me. And I, sorry, I'm giving, failing to give you the signals. Thank you. Uh, that are possible with any web-based voting system. Voter, uh, voter identity and authentication attacks, server penetration attacks, ransomware attacks, malware attacks, which are actually attacks on the voter's computer, uh, including both privacy and integrity attacks, automated vote buying and selling, and denial of service attacks. And I'm going to describe some of those now, but this is why, these are why the security community is saying, for all of these reasons, not, there's, no, uh, there's no technology that we expect in the future, uh, in the foreseeable future, that will uh, enable internet voting. So first I want to talk about authentication. If you're going to vote online, the first thing you have to do is identify who you are. You actually have to identify yourself by name because you have to be checked, to, you have to be an eligible voter, they have to check that you haven't already voted, and they have to check that you are not voting on behalf of somebody else, that you're not using somebody else's credentials like your spouse or your kid or somebody and voting for them because we do not allow proxy voting in the United States. So we need an actual identification, not just some ID number. And when you think about authentication, think about the many ways in society that we use, th that we authenticate ourselves with personally identifiable information or with challenge questions like your mother's maiden name or passwords. These are all hopelessly weak um, authentication methods for a national security application like voting. Um, Driver's license. Well, there, unfortunately, there's no way to present your driver's license uh, to an online voting transaction. You could maybe present an image of the driver's license, but that's totally forgeable. The driver's license has a lot of security, other security features built into it besides its image. And when you, when you go into an airport, and they, you, you'll notice that the, the person who checks you in looks at it under ultraviolet light and has scanners and so on that can read them. Uh, none of that stuff is transmittable over the internet. Same with your passport. There's no passport reader that you can identify yourself as, as a voter. Biometrics are becoming very popular. Of course, traditionally, we use wet ink signatures to verify uh, uh, voters when they sign in, but there's no way to transmit a wet ink signature over the internet. You can, of course, send a facsimile of a signature, but then that's totally forgeable. Fingerprints, eye scanners, face recognition, these are, these are uh, so-called authentication schemes that are becoming popular in smartphones, but you have to understand that, that, that there's no way to extend the authentication from the human to the smartphone all the way from the human to the server at the other end of the internet. Uh, the, the, when you use a, the fingerprint sensor on an, on an iPhone or an Android phone, that fingerprint isn't stored uh, off the phone. It's not remote. There's no way to authenticate yourself to a remote server using that, and there shouldn't be. It's way too dangerous. The, um, the good thing about uh, biometric authentication uh, is that it is special and 
to, to you and to you alone. The bad thing about it is you can never change it. If it's ever compromised, it's compromised forever. You can't change your fingerprints, you can't change your retinal scan, you can't change your face. Uh, there is, of course, public key cryptography. And if you uh, are in a situation where there's good, strong security IT support at both ends of the communication, then public key cryptography is a way of doing strong authentication. And I carry a, an RSA key such as, is, such as is shown here all the time for my own uh, purposes at work. Um, but the infrastructure required to do this and the, and the training required to use this uh, is beyond uh, our reasonable capability for in involving in a voting system today. And there are other problems with it too. Expiration dates, changing of names, changing of addresses and so on, it's, it would be a nightmare for voters. Move, moving on, ransomware attacks. Uh, so imagine that, the, that uh, the stored votes in an election or the voter registration database or the geographic database used uh, in an election, that that data is encrypted by a remote attacker. And uh, the offer is made to sell back that, that encrypted data for a lot of money in the form of bitcoins. Even if the attackers give the key back after you pay the ransom, there's no guarantee that they didn't change the data before they, they encrypted it. So you, when, they, when you decrypt it, the, you, you have altered data now, and you won't know that. There's a recent example of this. Last month, Montgomery County, Alabama, uh, its administrative networks were hit, and they were charged uh, nine Bitcoin, which is about $37,000, to be given the encryption key to decrypt their data. Now, this was not election data, but it could have been. Malware. Um, one of the dangers of online voting is that the machine from which you are voting is infected by malware. In the best circumstance with online voting, maybe there is strong security at the central end, uh, at the server end, maybe. But we have to presume that the client devices that people are voting from, their PCs and their smartphones, are not secured. We have to assume that they are unsecured. They are the weak point. And if they have malware in them, malware, if you're, if you're voting from a machine that has malware in it, uh, the, your, the malware can change your ballot, change your vote invisibly to you before your ballot is encrypted and sent off to its destination. Uh, there is malware that, that operates like this uh, that, that I could point to, but I've just been given a high sign that we're running out of time. Uh, Denial of service attacks. Um, there have been plenty of denial of service attacks in involving elections, and I list four of them here. There's really no, defense, no fundamental defense against denial of service attacks in any service, let alone uh, an election service. I'm going to skip this one again in the instance of time and remind you what happened uh, in 2016. Um, now, I've been talking about voting online here. Um, but I want to talk about what the Russians did, or at least what the, the federal government says they did. Uh, they attacked the email of the Democratic National Committee, of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, of John Podesta, the campaign chairman of the Clinton campaign. Uh, possibly they attacked the corresponding Republican uh, servers as well. We don't know because there's, that has not been revealed. It wasn't published in WikiLeaks uh, the way the Democratic side was. They attacked the statewide voter registration database of Illinois, and they stole a large fraction of the voter registration records of that state. They attacked and installed malware in the voter registration database server in Arizona. That was discovered. Um, they attacked, or at least probed, we don't really know what they did because it, the, the federal government has been very cagey about releasing any details, uh, the state ele election-related networks in about 20 other states. They attacked a vendor of e-poll books in Florida, so called, a company called VR Systems. Those poll books were used in Durham County, uh, North Carolina, and failed wildly, widely on election day that day, disenfranchising a lot of voters. I, we do not know that those two are, that the attack on VR Systems in Florida and the failures in North Carolina are connected. We don't know. Um, we would like to know, but unfortunately, uh, there's been no uh, I would say competent investigation of that. What else did the Russians do? Well, we don't really know. 
There isn't any evidence, any strong evidence, that they actually changed any votes in, in elections in the United States. But it's very important to realize that there's no strong evidence that they didn't either. Um, the government is releasing a lot of fairly strong statements assuring the public that no votes were modified. And I have no reason to suppose they were. They may very well not have been. But the government cannot know this because they have not done and in many cases cannot do the forensic studies that might be able to, uh, to, to uh, ascertain that. The closest we have is the Wisconsin recount. And as you know, there was no evidence of uh, Russian interference with the casting or counting of ballots in Wisconsin. Um, but other than that, we just don't have any, uh, any evidence. Moving on to blockchain, which was something I was specifically asked to talk about. I'll skip the cartoons, but uh, there's a lot of talk about, there's so much talk about blockchains that they made it into Dilbert cartoons. So what are blockchains? A lot of people are promoting blockchains as a way or as a tool in which to, with which to develop online voting. And uh, I wanna, I'm here to say that it's not going to work, but what is it? So a blockchain is a, basically a public le ledger in the cloud. By a ledger, I mean a linear log of data entries recording some kind of history of transactions. Um, the log is, or the, the ledger is readable by everybody from the cloud. You can download it. It's, it's, uh, and anybody can add to it. It is, append, you can append to it. You can't modify anything. You, you can only add to it. Um, the order of entries on the ledger is preserved, and no other, once, once entries are made in the, in the ledger, no other changes are possible. No edits, no reorderings, no deletions. It's perfectly tamper-proof. And the tamper-proofness, of course, is the security property on which people wish to build uh, other systems like online voting systems. Now, I'm, what I've given you here is an idealization of what blockchains are, and I'm, I'm going to tell you that even with perfect ideal blockchains, that's not enough to build an internet voting system out of. But you should be aware that um, in spite of the crypt cryptographic and distributed consensus protocols used to build blockchains, there's, there's a lot of complexity that I've hidden under the covers here that I'm not gonna, that I'm not gonna talk about. Um, but the, the primary example that everybody knows about with the use of blockchains is Bitcoin. Blockchains themselves have nothing to do with money uh, blockchains are just a distributed, reliable, tamper-proof ledger used in the implementation of cryptographic money systems like, block, like Bitcoin. So what do blockchains have to do with elections? Well, suppose you had an ideal blockchain uh, system such as I described earlier. Then the idea is that every voter from his private uh, smartphone or PC uh, would, would append his ballot uh, on the blockchain through the internet then uh, once the election was over, everyone would download the blockchain and see all the cast ballots and see what order they were cast in. And remember, although anybody added, could add his ballot to the blockchain, they could, they, they, uh, they, they, the blockchain is tamper-proof. Nobody can modify it. Nobody could delete any cast ballots. That's the security property that people are looking at. And so everybody who downloads this blockchain of ballots cast in an election could then audit and verify it for himself that the official tallies as announced are correct. And everybody would agree on the tallies and everybody would agree on the winners and looters, losers. And so in effect, you <laughs> wouldn't. Yeah, don't clap too soon though. But that's, but that's the vision. And as a vision, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a worthwhile vision. But does it secure democracy? All right, next slide. So there's nothing wrong with the concept of blockchains in general. And there are a lot of important applications for them that have nothing to do with voting or, for that matter, currency. But in the voting con uh, context, they only address the comparatively easy parts of the internet voting problem. The hard parts still remain. They do nothing to deal with the remote eligibility and authentication problem, for example. Um, if you, 
Remember, in voting, the first thing you have to do is to establish that you are a person who is registered to vote in the elections you want to vote in, and that you uh, and that you haven't voted yet, and that you are not voting on behalf of somebody else. Blockchain simply don't address that problem. That fundamental problem that I mentioned earlier is still there, blockchain or no chain, and we have no solution to it. They do nothing, blockchains, about the client-side malware problem. Your vote, if it ever gets successfully into the blockchain unmolested, that would be fine. But, but while you're composing it on your unsecure client device, uh, it's totally um, subject to malware and can be modified, as I said, before it leaves your machine to be, to be sent to the blockchain in the first place. We have no fundamental solution to the client-side malware problem, and blockchains don't even address it. Um, and then there are denial of service attacks. Uh, you may be sending your vote to some place that is collecting and, and, and uh, mining blocks and adding new blocks to the blockchain for everybody to look at. But if, that's, if that uh, place is under a denial of service attack, your vote is going to be delayed or it's, gonna be, it's not going to make it at all. Um, and again, blockchains do not offer any solution to the denial of service attack problem, any fundamental solution. Now, there are a lot of other issues that are too technical to, dis to discuss that may be manageable, but these are the key ones, the problems that I mentioned earlier in the talk that are not solved by blockchain but are central to the problem of securing online voting. So, last slide. Um, there are fundamental problems, computer science security problems that preclude internet voting for now and for the foreseeable future. We just don't have solutions even on the drawing boards for those problems. No strong national remote, or vote, uh, remote voter authentication system, no general solution to the client-side malware problem, no general solution for network denial of service attacks, no general solution to network to penetration attacks that I didn't, uh, I didn't even mention those earlier, and no meaningful auditability and verifiability um, and other things that I would take me too long to delve into now. So I'm going to I'm going to stop here and uh, and take any questions if we have time. I don't know if we do. Okay. Go ahead. Quickly with questions. You got five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jefferson. As an expert who's worked closely with past governments uh, here in the U.S., um, what is the best solution? I mean, you presented obviously the devil's advocate, you know, as a devil's advocate against internet voting. What, what would you say? Do you have something in mind, um, something you can clue us into? Well, I'm, mostly I was trying to make the case against online voting. It, the, the voting system that I recommend um, is paper ballots uh, cast preferably in person, if necessary, through the mail, uh, and, uh, and then machine counted, but having those counts uh, properly audited by a risk-limiting audit, I presume that, that that subject's already come up. Uh, come up at the, that's the way that I, su I suggest that we run our elections for the foreseeable future. Hi. Uh, I don't have a question per se, unless you <laughs> think it's questionable, but uh, being with Election Justice last year, we, we gathered lots of data from, testimonial data from people who uh, in, say, New York and California uh, asserted that their uh, voter registrations had been changed. Uh, and so their affiliation and their ability to vote in the primaries thus was negated. And I mean, the, num the numbers were large enough that I have to wonder, well, maybe that's one of the things the Russians were doing, making sure that uh, Hillary went against uh, Donald. So we don't know. I mean, there's, there, there is a large amount of anecdotal evidence that it's hard to evaluate. Um, and I don't have access to the statistics that you described. I would hope that election officials are paying attention to the number of people who, who are claiming that to have been disenfranchised for that reason. Um, and I don't I don't know any more, I think, than you do about yeah. it, so. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate, and I have yet to understand a lot of the details of what you, you put up here, but, I, but on a side issue that you brought in, I strongly disagree with you. 
uh, you, you brought in the issue of Russians hacking, and I've 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 studied at least 10 or 15 different people, veteran intelligence professionals for sanity, and many other people that are convinced that the things that came out of the Democratic Party and John Podesta's email were leaked and not hacked. And they have, as a background to that, William Binney, who designed the NSA uh, program to detect uh, uh, hacks. And I, I can, I wasn't, I didn't bring over all the papers I have on that, but I think we are being conned by the CIA and Hillary Clinton, who's been unwilling to, uh, you know, this is a side issue, and I'm, I don't want to waste your time with it, but I, I, the idea that you can just say Russians did this and Russians, which Russians, what evidence, no evidence that I've ever seen is there, so I'd really appreciate it if you take that out of your... Uh, Presentation. Well, let, me, let, me, let me partially agree with you, which is to say I am not privy to intelligence information on this and probably nobody in this room is. So I'm just going by the consensus of really a dozen uh, intelligence agents in the United States who agree on this point. You're right, William Binney does not agree and he makes a good point. Um, and so I, I'm not in a position to to adjudicate that dispute that are the Russians really responsible or are they not um, I'm just I'm, but I'm just going to go with the with the intelligence community assessment which is you know extremely same, broad the, these same three intelligence community people are the same ones that verify that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction in 2003 and this is one well, area I'm sorry that Donald Trump is right on, and the liberals, w without any evidence, jump over and say, yeah, well, you, this is a great thing, but to uh, impeach him on, but it's not true. And well, I'm, all right, I, I, I have nothing to add, I'm afraid. Thank you. I'll, I'll, if you're gonna be here tomorrow, I'll bring some papers I have. No, I won't be here tomorrow, sorry. Yeah. Okay, well, well, nevertheless, I think you, you can... can give them to Jim, and Jim will forward them to me. Uh, yes. Okay. Quick. Jim's okay. Next. Okay. Next. One, more, one more question. Go ahead. Uh, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to remember... Can't hear you. I'm trying to think, trying to remember, I had two separate questions. One was on, because they're doing the, um, they're doing their own integrity, um, which is not in voter integrity, it's um, trying to secure the next election. So if you can talk a little bit more about uh, if you believe that the one, the Voter Integrity Commission that the government has set up is what kind of damage it's doing, if any. And then, um, okay. And then the other part is for counting votes. Is it, I have to take an assumption that the reason why they're using the machines, the scanning machines to count the votes is because of time? And if that's the case, then I think that we should say something about how accuracy is more important than time, and also that people need jobs. So if we don't fund the machines, then we can fund the people who are more accurate um, to count the votes. All right. I'll, 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 address, I'll address both of your points. Um, the, the concerns of the Pence-Kobach Commission um, my primary criticism of them is that they are not addressing the central issues in election uh, uh, integrity, uh, except with one panel that was uh, held in, uh, in a New Hampshire meeting of the Pence-Kobach uh, Commission, the last panel, which had Professor Ron Rivest and Professor uh, um, Andrew Appel from Princeton and Professor, uh, uh, sorry, and Harry Hursty, famed, uh, famed independent hacker. Uh, their panel was brilliant and really blew the minds of the Pence Kobach Commission. If you, if you get a chance to see that panel, I would suggest you do. Uh, otherwise, they seem to be addressing issues that, that I think are at best secondary or partisan, and I'm, because to the extent that they're partisan, I'm just not gonna comment on them at all. Um, your second question, give me a, a key word again. Jobs. Oh, sorry, yes. Sorry, the machine counting versus versus hand counting of paper ballots, the the and the and the uh, trade off of accuracy versus time involved in counting the ballots. So, um, 
uh, there's nothing wrong with counting ballots by machine, however buggy, however malicious uh, code filled those machines are, as long as the paper ballots are, uh, are audited properly afterwards. And by auditing, I mean a risk limiting audit with uh, a, um, uh, with a, uh, a st uh, so with a random sample of the ballots, not the entire 100%, you, 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 you hardly ever need that, but a random sample of the appropriately statistically calculated size, and you hand count the random sample, and if the hand count of the random sample agrees strongly enough with the machine counts, you can be quite confident that the machine counts called the election correctly. That's what we are recommending. Some hand counting, not 100% hand counting. Okay? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Dr. Uh, David Jefferson.